All right. Um, welcome back, guys. So, just making this video to kind of talk through some periodic trends. Hopefully, most of these sound familiar. Kind of just review. Um, but let's make sure we all have this down pat. Um, like last time, watch this sped up. Skip through it if you need. Whatever. If you feel confident about it, then this is just to get to hear it again, I guess. Um, so, periodic trends. Here's a labeled PR table. Hopefully you already have your own version of this from the other night. Um, but there she is in all her glory. Important families are labeled. We have these three different categories of elements. Metals, non-metals, and then the weirdos in the middle. Metalloids. Um, other vocab that you might or might not be familiar with. Uh, when I'm talking about my periodic table, a period is the name of a row. Um, and a group is the name of a column. So, of course, they need their own special names, and then one more thing to learn. Great. Um, all right, so while we're talking about these, so a period trend, that's just like any pattern that we see in elements, um, any pattern in like their behavior or characteristics that we can attribute to patterns on the periodic table. Um, we'll talk about like why they happen also. Um, so things to know. The trends, like what those words mean, like what is electronegativity, what does that mean? Um, what is the trend in whatever trend, oh, say electronegativity. Um, a lot of questions will be like applying and making predictions based on the trends. So like, if this one has a electronegativity of this, what would you think the electronegativity of this one would be? Or order these in order of electronegativity, that kind of thing. Um, but the real thing I want to push home, um, you also need to be able to explain these. So just memorizing like the arrows, it'll get you part of the way, but it will not get you all your points. Um, so really practice explaining these to yourselves. Um, I'm gonna explain them in one way that works for my brain. Um, if you like, if you have to like work with it a little bit and find a way of phrasing it that works better for you, go for it. Um, but yeah, and those are a few strategies we might use to talk about, um, to explain the trends. Shell model, that's like Bohr model. And then I'll talk about the other two. So let's see, we got, we got Coulombs. Um, this is a same thing, like it's, it's literally like the exact same one, I think, as like what you learned if, for gravity, if you've taken a class where they taught you gravity stuff. It's like practically the same. Um, Coulomb's law can be used to talk about any charged bodies. And it's the way we talk about the attraction between any charged bodies. In chemistry, we care about the atom. So the charged bodies we're talking about is the nucleus and the electrons. Um, so here, let me, let me show you this good old beautiful formula. Force of attraction is equal to K Q1 Q2 over R squared. Um, so that's our force. Now, again, this, this um, formula could be applied to other things. So it could be force of attraction or it could be force of repulsion. But for this class, it will usually be between a positive thing, the nucleus, and a negative thing, the electrons. So for our sake, I'm gonna say it's force of attraction. Between Um, nucleus and electrons. Opposites attract, as they say. Um, K, don't worry about it. None of your business. Um, it's just a constant. It's just always there. I don't know what it is, and you don't need to know what it is either. Okay, Qs, both Qs are just whatever the charged thing is. So in our case, one of them is gonna be the charge of the nucleus. AKA how many protein, protons you got. Other Q, and now I feel like this is the part that people get a little confused about. This is the attractive force between one point in space and another point in space. So the nucleus, all of those protons are together. They, like, that's kind of like an additive, like all of that positive charge 
kind of sums up together. But when we're talking about the electron, it's the attractive force between the nucleus and one electron. Um, so we talk about like an electron at a time, theoretically. Um, usually we'll be talking about valence electrons. Um, the only reason I make that distinction is as we see, as you move across a period or a down a group, um, we're gonna be adding protons and electrons, but adding the electrons is not going to be a significant part of Coulomb's law. Um, I'll talk about the effect it does have, but if you're talking about Coulombs, make your argument in terms of, of proton, protons, not electrons. Um, R is distance between the bodies. So in this case, distance. Um, distance, that is a word. Um, between the nucleus and whatever electron you're talking about. Um, I'll just say in electrons. Um, usually it'll be valence, but sometimes it's not. Um, sick. So if you're talking coulombs and you just want, and you want to, um, validate it in terms of coulombs, important thing. So down a group, down a column, if you're comparing things in a column, the thing that is important that you're, you're adding shells. The Bohr model is kind of stupid, but like, it's helpful sometimes adding shells, adding orbitals, like as you get each energy level, by definition, we're getting farther and farther away from our nucleus. Um, so like the big takeaway that you wanna focus on if you're comparing down a group is that you're increasing your distance. Across a period, again, put the electrons out of your mind. The real important thing about as you go across a row is that you're adding protons. And so that's going to add your nuclear charge. So take a look, see back at that formula. Down a group, increasing distance, increasing your denominator. Increasing distance by definition of Coulomb's law will decrease the force of attraction. Q in the, your numerator, adding protons is going to increase your force of attraction by Coulomb's law. Um, kind of makes sense, right? Like bigger magnet, more stick, magnet farther away, less stick. It, it, it tracks. Okay, effective nuclear charge. So this is probably a new term if you have taken, if you haven't taken like a CC class. Um, so there's the force between the nucleus and between the electrons. Um, but as I'm taught, if I want to talk about the attractive force between my nucleus and my valence electrons, um, there's some stuff in the way. So as we're adding more and more electrons, um, that force of attraction is actually getting decreased. Um, most of the reason is because, or we call it shielding. Basically, it's because the electrons in the middle are messing with that force. And I'll, I'll draw it for you, so give you a little bit of a better picture for that. Um, Z effective is the, like the way it's shortened sometimes. This is the effective nuclear charge. So that's like in reality, how much charge is your electron experiencing? And it's equal to Z minus sigma. Z, that's your like actual nuclear charge. AKA it's your number of protons. Like if there was nothing in the way, what would your charge be? Sigma, it's called, it's called a shielding constant. Um, basically it's just like for every electron that you add, you're adding some amount of shielding constant as a part of that. So it's just something that like kind of gets bigger and bigger as we add electrons. It, it's what it's really capturing is the repulsion from each electron. Um, 
with both of these, um, for AP Chem, I, like, you'll never be asked to actually do number math with these guys. Um, it's, it's just theoretical, like, a, con a concept that you're going to apply to explain the trends. Um, so you don't need to know how to calculate sigma. Do not fret. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea of this, um, if I had an atom and it had shells and there were electrons on those shells. Oh, stop. <laughs> and there were electrons on those shells. My electrons, they wanna, they wanna come and hang out with the nucleus. They have this attraction with the nucleus, that positive to that negative charge. But that is not the only thing in the picture. There are also all of the other electrons hanging out and they're in the way. Um, basically what we're seeing here it's not like that they're steel, like it's an okay way to think of it, but in reality, the electrons aren't like taking the charge from the other electrons. It's that the electron electron repulsion is like negating. That's, you know, you get the point. Repulsion? No, 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 no. No, I was right the first time, just one eye. Okay, go away. My bad, my bad. <laughs> Repulsion um, offsets, like negates some of attraction. Yeah. So that's something to um, keep in mind. The real, the takeaway here is that valence electrons do not feel the full force of the nucleus. They don't get the full nuclear charge. They get the effective nuclear charge. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to usually default to Coulombs just because it tends to be a useful tool. I like it a lot. So that's what I'm probably going to use most today. Um, but this is definitely something to keep in your back pocket. Um, new valence electrons do not feel the full force of the nucleus because of uh, electron shielding. Um, they experience the um, effective nuclear charge instead. So you'll definitely see like that vocab and phrasing on stuff. And if you like this one, then you can use it to explain the trends as well. Okay, radius is our first trend. Um, it's what it sounds like. It is the radius of the atoms. Um, so like if you had an atom, ah, stop. the radius, so the distance from the nucleus to the valence, that is your radius. Um, so basically we're, we're talking about size of our atoms. Um, the trend for this guy is that they are biggest down here. They're kind of medium up here. That is, ooh, spicy circle. And they're small over here. So here, let's, if you want to draw the arrows differently, you totally can. Oh, why did, okay, sorry. If you want to draw the arrows differently, you totally can. I'm just gonna go across a period and down a group for all of them and just draw my arrows that way. Um, but if you don't like that, you can change it. Um, so across a period, it decreases. So that's what I mean if you want to draw it the other way to show that it, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, down a group, it increases. So let's think about why for both of those. Um, down a group, what we want to focus on, like I mentioned, um, And I won't write these out for all of them, um, just for the sake of time. But if you want to take, sorry, I think I glitched out for a second. Um, I'm not going to write down every word I say, but for the sake of time. But if you want to take good notes, and I'd recommend explaining something like this in your own words. Um, so down a group, the important thing that is happening is our N is increasing. our number of energy levels, our number of shells. Um, that means that 
are, we are increasing distance, which means by Coulomb's law, or sorry, not even Coulomb's law. This one's, this one's straightforward. You're adding more shells. You're adding more distance. Um, that means that your radius is bigger. Pretty straightforward with that one. But that's the explanation, because we are adding energy levels down a group. Um, up here, as you go across a period, you are increasing your number of protons. Um, also, side note, I don't know if I've said this in class yet, um, protons can be written like this, or it could be written like this. Those both mean protons. You'll probably see both. Um, so increasing your number of protons will increase your effective nuclear charge. And your nuclear charge, but you know. If there is more charge, then we are getting more Coulombic attraction. So if more charge, more attraction, that means that we are going to be, um, basically the electrons are like really pulled. Electrons are pulled in tightly. That's how I like phrasing it at least. Um, more pull on those electrons, they're gonna smoosh on in. We end up with our radius decreasing. So pulling the electrons close to itself because it has more protons. Okay, next. Um, ionic radius, what the name says. It's like a radius, but it's an ion. Um, let's talk about both types of ions. So vocab reminder, cation, that means we have a positive charge, like, like a cat, pop positive. Um, it means we've lost an electron. Anion, negative charge, we have added an electron. Um, so let's compare. If I had fluorine, and it became fluorine, but minus. Um, I think the really helpful, like, you can kind of like reason it out in your brain also, but I think the most helpful metric for this is just like comparing your protons to your electrons. So let's do that. How many protons do we have versus how many electrons we have? Fluorine, look at your periodic table. Its atomic number is nine. And when it's neutral, it would also have nine electrons. Still fluorine, still has nine protons, but we've added an electron. Um, there's different ways to think about it. You could think about it as like, I've added an electron, the electron's taking up more space, and that's why my radius gets bigger. Mm, good circle. Um, you could think about it as there's more electrons for the nucleus to try to hold on to. There's more repulsion between those electrons. Whatever makes sense to your brain, but if we're adding an electron, we are making our radius bigger. Anions have a bigger charge than their neutral version. Cations to opposite. So if I had sodium, and it became positive sodium, sodium ion. There are 11 protons in any sodium. And if it's neutral, there are also 11 electrons. Um, still sodium, still 11 protons. We have taken away an electron. We have 10 electrons. Um, more effective nuclear charge, pretty much. Um, more force of attraction between our electrons and our protons. Um, if we are taking away electrons, we are decreasing our radius. Um, 
I think like like the TLDR, like I think the best thing to think about is for this is the greater the um, proton electron ratio. You're gonna get a smaller atom. Um, so like if we wanted to compare things, so these top ones we're comparing neutral to charged. What about if we want to compare multiple ions? Um, down a group, especially it, it mostly follows radius trends. Um, but if I want to make comparisons across a period, um, let's kind of practice that. It's only really useful if they're in the same period, if they're isoelectronic. If you haven't heard that vocab word before, it means um, same amount of electrons, same electron configuration. So maybe make a note of that one. Um, so I can compare ions if they have the same amount of electrons. So let, let's try one. Um, if I was comparing sodium cation, magnesium cation, and the aluminum cation. Those are all in a period together. Again, I think just the most, the easiest way to do it is just comparing their ratios. So looking at my periodic table, 11 and it's lost an electron, so 10 electrons. 12 and it's lost two, so 10. Um, 13 and it's lost three, so 10. So this part, they have the same electrons, isoelectronic. Um, so if I want to compare which one do I think is going to be the smallest, um, I'm going to look at this ratio, my protons to my electrons. This one has more protons. There's more positive force. There's more nuclear charge pulling on those electrons. Therefore, we're going to have our smallest atom here. So if I'm talking radius, they're going to get smaller this way. Hopefully that makes sense. More nuclear charge, more pull, smaller situation. Um, same thing can be said of anions. Also, it's totally fine if you write like the minus first or the minus after the number. There's probably some rule about it, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I do both. <laughs> um, so again, pluses. Seven protons, ten electrons, eight protons, ten electrons, and nine protons, ten electrons. The one that is smallest is the one with m the most effective nuclear charge. Um, this guy. More positive charge pulling on those electrons. So this one's going to be our smallest, and this one's going to be our biggest. Okay. So, example problem, perhaps try on your own, if you would like to pause and try it. And now that you've paused the video that you definitely did, here is how you go about this guy. So even though they're not all in the same period, we can still make the comparison because they're isoelectronic. There'd just be too much to worry about if they weren't. So if they all have the same amount of electrons, that'll make it easier. That's what you're generally going to be asked to do. So the one with the most effective nuclear charge, the most attractive abilities is going to be this guy. So that means that magnesium is our smallest. Um, then fluorine, then oxygen. Okay. Yeah, I feel like that one's not too bad. Okay, good old ionization energy. Um, this, I'm just gonna give like an intro to each of these and then we'll do some more like practice problems in class is the idea. Add a little bit of complexity 
this is just a little overview. Um, ionization energy. So this is the amount of energy required to remove an electron from a ion, or sorry, from an atom. So basically what this comes down to is how much is that atom holding on to that electron? Um, how much energy is it gonna take to pry it out of the atom's cold dead hands? Um, if you like seeing it in formula ways, um, starting with a neutral thing, removing one electron, it's the amount of energy I had to put in in order to do that. Now, if you've only taken honors chem, then we've only really talked about this as like a first ionization energy. But in reality, you can take another electron away and then take another electron away and take another electron away. Um, each time you take one electron away, you get a new ionization energy. Um, so our first ionization energy, that's removing the first electron, changing it from neutral to plus one. Second ionization energy is plus one to plus two, removing that second electron. Um, notice that we're only removing one electron at a time. You never remove more than one at a time for this. Um, and you also will notice, or I'll, actually there's no numbers here, I'll just note for you, the second is always larger. So we'll talk about stability in class and like a little bit of complexity to this. Um, but even if it's like a stable situation, you're always gonna have to put in more energy in order to take away more electrons. Um, okay, your big ol', your overview summary is that across a period, it increases and down a group, it decreases. Um, so explanation here. Um, as I go across a period, I am adding protons. I am increasing my nuclear charge. So that increases my coulombs. So that will increase my ionization energy. If the a nucleus is really holding on to those electrons. I'm gonna to have to add more energy to tear them away. Versus down a group. Down a group, I am getting further away from my nucleus. I'm getting a larger atomic radius. Which means that I will have less Coulombic attraction. which means that I have a lower ionization energy. If the electrons are like way over there, like take them, I got plenty. They're, they're just, they're, I can like barely hold on to those as it is. It takes less energy. Um, that's all for ionization energy for here. In class, we will do the rest of these problems. Oops, come on, we'll come back to that. Okay, electron affinity, okay, sick. Well, we'll get through what we can. Um, okay, I, I messed up, <laughs> or like, there's a little bit, like, sometimes you'll see it the way I have it written here, but on it, like, I think it just makes it more complicated, and honestly, it's like, never like this. So, please erase this, pretend it doesn't exist, pretend this doesn't exist, my bad, pretend I didn't even write it. Um, electron affinity, um, just to keep it pretty straightforward, um, this is the energy that, the energy change that happens when an electron is accepted. So it's kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy, we're taking an electron away. Electron affinity, we are adding an electron. Adding an electron to an atom, so making it into an anion. Um, Notice for this one, it's a negative number. This might sound familiar. If it doesn't, we'll do a whole lot more with it when we do energy in later units. But just for your information, a negative means that energy is being released. 
Um, AKA, this tends to be, this is like more favorable. Um, they're not always negative. Sometimes they don't really want another electron, but we'll talk about that in class. Um, there's really not, like you don't need to know that much um, about electron affinity. It's just a measure of the energy from adding an electron. Um, I think like what I was thinking, what, or like why some people say that it's a positive. <laughs> Here, let me let me draw the arrows, and then I'll say what I'm trying to say. Um, it gets it increases across a period, and it decreases down a group. Um, Okay, so since if it is favorable, most of the numbers you'll see for this are going to be negative numbers. Sometimes you'll see them as positives, but usually you're seeing negative numbers. So when I say increases, I mean like a bigger negative number, just to be clear on that. So like chlorines is like negative 300 and something, and this one's is negative a smaller number than that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, again, you don't, like, you're never going to have to come up with the numbers. Um, you just need to know what the trend is. Um, duh, 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 duh. All it really means, um, your big takeaway is that a large atom, or sorry, a large electronegativity, shoot, a large electron affinity means that you have a stable anion. It's chilling with that extra electron. Perhaps it even likes that extra electron. We'll talk more about that in class, but just to kind of explain the why, um, it in increases across a period we're adding more protons. It's able to hold on to that new negative better. Down a group, we're adding shells. Less attraction from the nucleus means it can't hold on to a new electron that well. It's kind of the basics of the trend. And again, there are exceptions to the trend and we will talk in class about that. Um, electronegativity. Now, <laughs> some might say that this is the exact same thing as electron affinity. And some might be me. It's not actually the exact same thing. Um, it will get you like most of the way, most of the time, if you wanna pretend they're similar. Electron affinity is the energy to add an electron. Electronegativity is an atom's ability to attract an electron. Um, I think the biggest distinction is that this one's more important for bonding, and the other one is like straight up putting an electron on an atom. One's like a characteristic of an atom in a bond, one is an energy. But the, I mean, they're, they're really similar. Um, same trend. It increases across a period as we add more nuclear charge. It's easier to pull on electrons. As I go down a group, there is more distance, which means less attractive force, which means less pull. I'm not gonna write that for the sake of time. You can write that. More distance, less attraction, less ability to pull on a new electron. Okay, also another typo I found. I definitely meant to write nickel. Um, I just didn't type the I. So with that in mind, which one do we think would be the most electronegative? If it doesn't ask you to explain, you can have your trends down, or you could go through and reason through each of them. Again, for the sake of time. Um, oh, wait, actually, sorry. Back up here. Just so you know, um, fluorine is our most electronegative. And 
the noble gases have no electronegativity. So no electronegativity for these guys. They don't want more electrons. They're so stable, they're so happy, they don't even bond. Leave them alone. It's also, they're also super low up here. Sorry, okay. Back to our regular scheduled program. Following my trends, I could just like see where they are on the periodic table. That's kind of what I recommend if you're trying to do like a multiple choice question. Um, fluorine's way up there. That is going to be our most electronegative. Barium's down here, francium's down here, and sulfur is over here. So just looking at my diagonal trend, sulfur is gonna be my next big, barium's gonna be my next big, and why did I say francium? Nope, that's not even what the question. <laughs> I'm tired, obviously. Never mind. Nickel is the other thing we were looking at. My bad. Sulfur is the next one in order, then nickel, then barium. So again, hopefully you just see that pattern if you're just doing memorizing the trends, but think through, spend a little bit more time on your own thinking through, can you explain why fluorine would have more electronegativity than sulfur? Why nickel would have more than barium? All right, welcome back. Um, all right, last trend. Wow, I was really almost done. Okay, that's fine. <sighs> okay, last one is our metal reactivity. You'll also hear it called just like metal characteristic or metallicness, anything like that. Um, so what we really need to know in order to understand this one is that metals, by definition, want to lose electrons. Um, if you want to prove it to yourself, you can draw the Bohr model for like lithium or sodium any metal, all of them, they would be more happy, they're more close to having a full shell being, being stable if they lose electrons. Um, that's why if you look at the periodic table, all of the metals have positive charges. There's none that have negative charges. Um, so metals, by definition, want to lose electrons. So if we're talking about their reactivity, their metalness, their metallic characteristic, we are looking for ones that can lose electrons more easily. So more metallic equals um, easier to lose electrons. Um, I'm just gonna focus on metals. Uh, just know that non-metals are the opposite. Non-metals want to gain electrons. Okay, sorry. Um, non-metals want to gain electrons. So all everything I say right now is gonna be the opposite for them. You don't get questions about them quite as much, but just so you know. Okay, so your trend on this one, it increases down a group and it decreases across a period. Um, so let's talk about the group first. Down a group, once again, that means we're gonna focus on the change in our um, radius, the change in our number of shells. As I'm adding more and more energy levels, I'm getting a bigger radius, more distance between my nucleus and my electrons. So, I don't know, I'll just shoop. Or not, this is so good at drawing. Um, if I'm trying to lose an electron from way out here, it's gonna be easier than if I was trying to lose an electron from closer. I mean, it makes sense. I don't know why I bother drawing something. It's not very useful, sorry. Um, less Coulombic attraction, less hold on the electrons, easier to lose them. Um, opposite is true up here. Um, across a period, you are adding protons. You're adding Coulombic attraction. There is more force between the nucleus and the electrons. It's holding onto those electrons. The ones up here, really don't want to lose electrons. They're going to hang on to them. That's why these ones are non-metals, not metals. Um, so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, metallicness. We'll talk more about metals next unit. Um, this is one of the things that defines them is that they like losing electrons. They like becoming um, cations. So let's compare these guys. Um, again, it's a good exercise if you want to practice 
think through, can you explain each of these guys, like each of the comparisons? Um, but for the sake of time on this video, I'm just going to look at them on a periodic table. So as if they were, as if this was a multiple choice question. So I know that my bottom left corner is my most metallic. So francium is going to be my most metallic and that makes sense because of its size. So, you know, practice explaining it if you want some more practice. Um, but that's it. So that's kind of our overview of the six trends you need to know. Um, and yeah, check out the practice problems. We'll do some more practice in class. And if you want to revisit this or hear someone else go over it, Khan has some really good resources on it. And um, yeah, check those out or ask me if you want to help finding other resources. Excellent.